Uh, how many of you are old enough to remember a time when you had to physically walk into a bank and talk to another human being to get money? Oh, this is a young crowd. Um, yeah, well, I remember, I'm, I'm older than many of you, but I remember a time when on Fridays after school, my mom would be frantic to pick me up and then run to the bank before it closed so that we would have money for the weekend because otherwise you just didn't have money until the bank opened on Monday. And this is a quaint story for us these days because as we all know, technology, digital network technology has completely revolutionized the way that we manage our personal finances. And I am still in awe that I can take a picture of a check with my phone and in hours that money will be in my bank account. And it's not just the personal financial industry that has been revolutionized by digital and network technology. Everything we do in our lives, from school and education to how we interact with our friends and family, has been completely changed. But there's still one place in our world where that change hasn't really taken root, and it's in government. This is a picture of the Department of Motor Vehicles in California, which for Americans is a symbol of government dysfunction in this line is what people expect to find when they go to the DMV. Most Americans end up there at some point and most of them have a very bad experience. And so we ask ourselves at Code for America, why is that experience so bad? When we have the sum of the world's knowledge in the palm of our hands and we can connect with anyone at any time, why do we make it so hard to connect with government? Why do we force people to go to town hall rooms that sit empty if they want to talk to their representatives? And democracies are built on trust, the trust that the people have in their governments. And when we provide experiences with government that are so divorced from the lived experience of people's lives, what does that do to trust in democracy? And those are the questions that we ask ourselves at Code for America, and my colleagues and I uh, address that problem and those questions in three ways, and I'm gonna talk about those three ways today. So first, we work almost exclusively with cities. Um, we work with cities to create capacity inside of city government to bring innovation to their cities. The second way we do this is through uh, creating new channels for participation, so allowing citizens to actually participate in building government. And the third way is through building interfaces to government, tools that make the experience with government uh, better more empowering. So let's start with cities. You might be surprised to hear that there are actually very many innovative people working inside city government. They just happen to be stuck inside a system that does not promote experimentation. It does not reward risk taking. And that's understandable because uh, when you take a risk in government and fail, the price is higher than it is in the private sector. And so there's no space inside government for people to experiment. So we work with cities to create these spaces. And uh, an example of this is New Urban Mechanics, which is a um, kind, of, kind of a trend happening across the US. Uh, there are two New Urban Mechanics departments and then 11 others in other US cities um, that are modeled, departments of innovation that are modeled on New Urban Mechanics. And there's, a, there's now a new one in Mexico City as well. So this is spreading around the globe, and basically what New Urban Mechanics is is an aggregator for risk in government. It's the place you can go, their mandate is to take on experimental and risky projects. So if you work in the Department of Transportation and there's something that you wanna experiment with, you go to these guys, and if it fails, they'll take the blame. If it succeeds, then you get the reward. And so we're creating these spaces where, city, where government officials can experiment and apply new tools and methodologies to old problems. The second way is by creating new ways for citizens to build their government. And I'm gonna tell one story that gets at three of those different avenues. In Honolulu in 2012, our team there, which in this case was made up of three full-time uh, technologists who were doing a year of public service were asked by the city to rebuild the website, which looked like this, not a very beautiful website, all apologies to Honolulu. Um, certainly not a website that is be befitting the beauty of the city. Um, and the fellows were asked to rebuild this site, which was going to be too much work in the time that they had. 
And so what they did instead was they asked, okay, well, what are citizens actually trying to do when they come to your website? What are the actions they want to take? And instead of rebuilding the website, they built a site that was uh, much more in line with what, what the actions that citizens are trying to take, which is not really fostered with a site that looks like this. So they built Honolulu Answers, where you type in a question or a, a search term and get back super simple, plain language answers to those questions. So the site itself was not that hard to build. But they were faced with the challenge of how they would populate all of the content for this site. It would have taken the three of them a very long time, and none of them happened to be residents of Honolulu, so they did something that's actually very radical when you think about how government is used to working. They asked the citizens to write the content. So you've probably heard of a hackathon. They held a write-a-thon where in one Saturday afternoon, citizens came and took the most relevant questions. In this case, a lot of people in Honolulu are concerned about wild pigs. Um, and, they, and then one Saturday afternoon, they answered most of the frequently asked questions. And by doing so, built their government. And I'm really excited about the fact that in Oakland, where I live, the Code for America Brigade, which is our citizen volunteer program, took that code base from Honolulu and redeployed it as Oakland Answers. And uh, again, we took the, the most commonly asked questions and wrote answers to them, and I even got into the act, and it was really exciting. So in this one example, you see three new avenues for citizens to actually build government. There's this one-year full-time public service program. There's a citizen volunteer program where you can uh, build these things where you live, and then those citizen volunteers reach out to their fellow citizens to create events like write-a-thons, where people who don't have technical skill can also participate. The third way, and probably the most important, is that we build tools, we call them interfaces, and those interfaces can be uh, the counter at the DMV, or a form you have to fill out, or a website. We build tools that promote a positive civic experience. And this is a quote from one of our first fellows that has become our mantra, that interfaces to government can be simple, beautiful, and easy to use. And by making those experiences simple, beautiful, and easy to use, we promote participation, engagement, and action in citizens, and hopefully rebuild trust. So I'm going to tell you one story from Boston that is a really good example of those kinds of beautiful interfaces to government. So Boston, um, our fellows arrived there in 2011 um, to find a situation where uh, the city had just moved to um, a policy of school choice, which meant instead of sending your child to the neighborhood school, you now had a choice of where to send your kids. But Boston is a very big and diverse school district. It's almost 60,000 students, 135 schools. Um, those schools are run the range from 130 seats to over 1,200 seats. Their um, achievement scores are wide. This is the MCAS is the state um, achievement test that every student in Massachusetts has to take. And the demand for every seat ranges over those 135 schools. So there's a very complex formula about how uh, each uh, parent can request a school and how those uh, seats are actually assigned. And so the first year that uh, this policy was in place, every parent in Boston got a book that looked like this. And it was 30 pages long. And you could read this entire book and still have no idea how to actually go about making the choice of where to send your student. And as parents, I know there are many parents in the room, you can imagine this was a very uh, anxious and frustrating process. And the local newspaper um, did an expose on what they called the school assignment maze. The process was so hard um, that the newspaper was profiling the experience that parents were having trying to place their children in school. And so this was the context that our fellows came into Boston with in 2011, and the city was desperate for them to help create a better way for parents to select schools for their children. And, this, and the fellows knew that there was an easier way to do this. So what they built instead was Discover BPS. You enter two pieces of information, your child's age and your address, and you get back a list of every school that your child is eligible for, including information on the test scores, how far the bus stop is, 
how much or what kind of extracurricular activities there are. And so parents were given full and clear information and were empowered to make informed decisions about one of the most important things they're going to do that year, decide where to send their kids to school. And of course, we heard directly from the school district that this changed their relationship between the parents and the school district. This tool helped promote trust and empowerment in citizens in Boston. So that's a great story. I love telling that story. There's one story um, that's actually going on right now in the States. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with what's going on with the healthcare website. Show of hands. Okay, a few of you. So um, the healthcare reform, the Affordable Care Act, as it's called, which passed um, as President Obama's legacy achievement, probably will um, endure as the, the thing that when we think of what President Obama did with his uh, domestic agenda 50 years from now, it will be that he passed universal health care reform. And uh, this policy goes into effect in January, and so there's a sign-up period that launched in October where citizens who didn't have insurance could go to the uh, healthcare.gov, which is uh, the exchange, the marketplace, where they can purchase insurance and find out what subsidies they're eligible for. Well, that website is a total disaster. Um, it doesn't work. This is the page that citizens see when they go to this website. And as you can imagine, right now, this is the biggest story in the U.S., this broken website. And so clearly there's a political cost for the president because the Republicans are obviously quick to exploit any mistakes that he makes. There's a financial cost. This broken website cost about $400 million to build. Um, but more than, and there's a cost to the policy as well. So there are people without health insurance who now cannot sign up for health insurance. But more than that, because eventually the website will get fixed and people will, there will be some way for the policy to be enacted so that people can sign up for insurance. But the long-term cost of the undermining of trust that citizens have in the competency of their government based on their experience with this website will be lasting and it will be hard to undo. So for us, we think that these are the problems that we're trying to solve and that this is what's at stake. This is how people interact with the policy decisions that lawmakers make. And when those are bad experiences, it undermines trust in government. So hope, thankfully, there are ways for all of you to participate. As Eva said, we're having a hackathon tonight where you guys can participate in uh, building Poland's government and hopefully avoiding mistakes like healthcare.gov. And I hope to talk to more of you about that later this evening. Thank you.